Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nicole Webb, and we really hope the message today blesses you. If you'd like to know more about Liberty Church, please go online to lbcdublin.com. Well, today we get another special treat. Last week we had Bob Recker come. This week we have my good friend Dustin Shack. Come on up, Dustin. So Dustin is my college roommate. We went to the University of Louisville together, and we're both representing our current state, which is Georgia. So you can give us a hand for that. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, but here's, here's, oh, my bad. I missed, missed the handshake there. My bad. So Dustin and I lived together for how many years? A year or two? Yeah. We lived yeah. together for long about enough. two years, long enough. Watch it. I, I understood yeah. what was going on there. So he saw me before I was walking with Christ, as I started walking with Christ, and then when I really got passionate for my relationship with Christ. I knew him right when he came to know Christ. The neat thing is, so I've known Jesus longer than he has, but he started walking with Jesus a lot quicker, and he's been a mentor for me for several years. He's pastored a church in Atlanta called Northside Church for 10 years. Him and his wife, April, wave, wave hi, everybody. She doesn't want to wave too loudly. But uh, they've been married for, how many years have y'all been married now? 22 years. 22 it's years. Serious. It's getting serious. Yeah. I hope so. Serious. But uh, Dustin's a great friend, been a mentor for a long time. He's actually younger than I am too. I look up to him in stature, but also in spiritual wisdom as well. So I'm so honored that he's getting to preach for us today. Y'all are gonna be encouraged as he's talking about grieving like Jesus. So tune in, lean in, open your Bible, take some notes, use some notes in your margin. You can use the handouts that we gave you as well as the fill in the blanks. Let me pray for Dustin as we open up God's word. Father God, Lord, this is the day that you have made. And so, Lord, we rejoice in it, and we just lean into you so that you can speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you give Dustin the ability to articulate, give him the ability to communicate what you've already prepared in his heart. Lord, I pray for our hearts that we will just be tuned in to what you want to say to us. Help us not be distracted by sports, by notification, by lunch plans, by the hot dog that's waiting for us outside. Help us to be distracted by you and you alone. Help us to tune into your word and tune into exactly what you want to say to us. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks, Dustin. Thanks, Nate, so much. I'm just incredibly honored to be here uh, with you. And uh, man, Nate is my first Christian friend. And especially some of you have come to know Christ more recently. Uh, you know what it's like to try to like disassociate from bad friendships that pull you away from Jesus and try to form new friendships that pull you toward Jesus. But for a guy especially, that's super hard because you can't just walk up to a group of guys at a Bible study and say, hey, would you be my friend? Because that's weird, don't do that. Uh, but that's kind of what I had to do. I walked up to Nate and I just heard something about Jesus and he had a Buick Skylark and that's about all I knew about him. And uh, man, I just kept hanging out with them because I didn't have any Christian friends at all, but I knew I needed them. And I, I promise you, I cannot possibly imagine my Christian testimony apart from Nate being a part of it. And uh, brother, you're just one of my oldest, dearest friends. Man, I love you and Stacy. When I think about Stacy and Nate, I think, about, I think about two things. I think about three things, really. I think about how they love Jesus. I think about how you love people. And I think about your passion for holiness. And that has been a constant encouragement me to me throughout all the years that I've, I've known Jesus. And so thank you, dear brother, for allowing me to, to be here with you. Uh, I wanna show you a picture of my, my family, my crew. Uh, you'll see my wife, April, there. This is on a trip uh, out west that we're able to do this summer. I'll tell you a little bit more about that here in a little bit. Wife and I have been married for 22 years. Uh, the beautiful girl in the bucket hat there is our daughter, Kenzie. She is getting married this year. She decided to rip my heart out of my chest and fry it in an open pan and marry this guy named Judd. And he's an awesome guy and she's a great girl and we're, we're celebrating that. Uh, in the glasses there is a younger daughter, Macy. She's a fantastic runner, go cross country, but she's an even better uh, person and human being. We treasure her. Uh, the guy on the right who looks just like me is our oldest son, Malin. He came to our family through adoption from uh, Ethiopia and he's tough and he's tender. He wants to pursue military and Air Force kind of things and all that, and I love him so much. And then Baylor is our little guy there in the front. I love Baylor so much. If Baylor could hop in a space shuttle right now and go to outer space, uh, he would do it. He loves all things uh, exploration and science and engineering, and I uh, just appreciate his humility and how he walks with Jesus. And so that's my family, and, and that's my crew. And I told you a bit about Nate and our relationship, how we go all the way back to uh, college. And I remember one particular Saturday when I was in, in college and we were at the stadium cheering on the University uh, of Louisville and our team, uh, we, well, I was there and, and, and it was myself and then April was standing kind of right next to me and then Nate was in front and Nate would just 
scream like the whole game, like the entire game. He would just scream as loudly as he possibly could. And so our team scored a touchdown. The Cards scored a touchdown. And so Nate went crazy. He's high-fiving everybody around me. And he turned to my wife, April, and he picked her up, like literally picked her up out of her seat there. She was run one row ahead of him. And what he didn't realize is there's like a cantilevering type the weight thing that happened whenever he picked her up. And then the two of them just timbered back like a tree falling slowly in the woods into everybody behind them as they crashed down together into the group of Cards fans. And in that moment, I was like, man, I don't, I don't know if I need like a new girlfriend, if she's dead, I don't know if I need a new best friend, if he's dead in front of everybody. But in that moment, I knew, man, I, I, just, I just love this guy and I love, love Nate, man. There's a lot of really fun Saturdays, like fun Saturdays celebrating your team. Again, if you're a cross-country fan like ours, you know, watching skinny kids run around in a circle, that's super fun to see that happen. Cheering on your team, eating great food, having all kinds of fun there. Saturdays can be really fun, but metaphorical Saturdays can be really, really hard. When I say metaphorical, metaphorical Saturdays, here, here's what I mean. On Friday, we celebrate that Jesus was crucified on the cross for our sins. He became our perfect substitute. And on Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, the fact that Jesus rose from the grave and he invites us to participate with him so that we could experience our own resurrection here on earth and new life in Christ and here in the world to come as we live in eternity with Jesus. But then there's these metaphorical Saturdays. Man, there's these days between that are just super, super dark. And these Saturdays are hard to deal with as Christians because we want to be like, man, the joy of the Lord is my strength and I can do all things and I should be peaceful because of Jesus. But we carry these deep, dark things and we walk in these deep, dark seasons where other people may not even know the struggles that we're in. And it's just dark and it's just hard. Man, when you've faced the pain of miscarriage, when you face the pain of, of barely knowing a father, barely knowing a mother and growing up that way, when you face the pain of the, the loneliness of a single season of life, when you face the pain of physical pain and news from a doctor or no news from a doctor, you don't even know what's wrong with you, when you face the pain of, a, of an eating disorder, when you face the pain of deep depression and anxiety, man, it feels dark. If you face the pain of kids who have gone astray, somebody told me this year that there's no pain like kid pain. And man, that hit deep inside of my soul. Man, we face these Saturdays and sometimes we feel a little bit unequipped, a little bit unable to deal with the kind of pain that comes our way. And I want to be very practical and straightforward with you today when we talk about how to grieve like Jesus and how we can experience loss and do so for the glory of Christ. Because when people are hurting, they don't need the Greek word for life jacket. They just need somebody to throw them one. And so I want to give us some real practical ways that we can grieve to the glory of the Lord and even look how, at how Jesus himself grieved. And so what do you do when you go through a Saturday? Turn to the book of Matthew chapter 14. The book of Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. And listen, like Nate said, I remember the day when somebody's like, turn to the book of Ephesians. And I was like, I, don't, I didn't even know that was a book in the Bible. That's news to me right now. And so, look, there's no judgment at all. We're drawing a big circle around this room. This is a, a judgment-free zone. So check out those table of contents. Make your way over to the book of Matthew. If you have your device and you want to follow along on a device, the book of Matthew, I'll assume that you're following along with the sermon and not catching up on reels in our time together. If you want to follow along in there, if you want to take some notes, if you want to take some notes on the back of your book, bulletin as we uh, think about how to grieve like Jesus. Point number one, I've got three points for you. Point number one is this, the Lord owes us nothing. The Lord owes us nothing. Uh, in Luke chapter one, Jesus and John the Baptist, we see, are best friends since before they were even born. And so Mary's the mother of Jesus, Elizabeth's the mother of John the Baptist. They get together, and I don't know if they like, like touch prego bellies or something happened there, but it says that the baby that was inside Elizabeth leapt in her womb leapt in her womb. So they were buddies since before they were even born. They, they grew up together. And some of you are fortunate to have friends like this, friends you had sleepovers with. Like I remember my friends, we'd set up Hot Wheels tracks and see which Hot Wheels were the fastest there. Or we'd play Monopoly and we'd make up all our own rules like everybody does when they play Monopoly. Or get other friends and play with Pokemon cards. I don't know what you did, but like lifelong kind of friends. That's the kind of friends that, that Jesus and John the Baptist were. Okay, that sets up the context. Matthew 14, 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. 
And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. So let's talk about Herod for a second. And so Herod is a tetrarch. I don't, I don't know if you have a tetrarch of Dublin, Georgia, but you probably don't. Because a tetrarch is a local leader of an outpost of a Roman occupied territory. And if you know anything about the Romans, these are brutal, brutal, brutal people. And the Romans didn't invent the cross, but it's been said that the Romans perfected the cross. I mean, they were ruthless in the way they would inflict terror into their enemies. I mean, they could just end lives just like at a snap of their fingers. And so Herod's this kind of guy leading as a leader of this kind of government out in this area where John the Baptist is. And so let's see what happens in verse three. For Herod had seized John and bound him, put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Okay, so John the Baptist is a prophet. And as a prophet, he speaks the words from God. And John the Baptist called out Herod because Herod took his brother's wife and married her. So his brother didn't die. He just thought his brother's wife was really good looking and said, I want her to be my wife and just took her from him. So this is the kind of shady character that Herod is in this moment. And so, so look what John did. We see it in verse four. John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. And so he knew that John was like a first century influencer. So in that moment, if he just immediately put him to death, all the Jews in the area would just rise up against him and it would create some kind of revolt. And so he said, I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to do something else in order to, uh, in order to uh, squash his influence. And he threw him in jail. So you have Herod, you have John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in jail. John the Baptist and Jesus were best friends. Okay, we're caught up here. Now, Herod is going to have a birthday. Herod's going to have himself a big birthday party. And when you think about Herod, I get serious Kuzco vibes. And so I don't know if you're old enough to remember this movie. I don't know if you remember The Emperor's New Groove. Do you remember this movie? I mean, this is one of like the best animated movies like ever. Like it's just, if you haven't seen it, like this tonight, tomorrow, you know, as an act of worship, carrying out from our time together gathered, you need to go and you need to watch Emperor's New Groove. It is absolutely amazing. I can't at the top of my head think of anything shady in it whatsoever. And so Cusco throws himself, wants to throw himself like this huge birthday party. He wants to build himself this huge castle so he can live in there and have a swimming pool. So he takes everybody else's land. So that's the kind of guy that Herod is. He's like a ruthless kind of guy. So verse six, his birthday finally comes around. His, his personal celebration of himself. When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. And so Herodias, new character here. Herodias is Herod's new wife. Remember, he married his brother's wife, so that's Herodias. So she has a daughter. So this is Herod's stepdaughter. So she comes and dances at his big birthday party, and he really likes it. He really likes it. I don't know if there's anything creepy there, but he just thinks it's really awesome. Verse 7, so he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask prompted by her mother. So again, her mother's angry because John the Baptist is trying to call them out in this new marriage. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. This is not a functional family. Like this is dysfunction like times a thousand. Like what do you want for your dance that you just did? I want the head of a man. Like if your child does that, Get help, get help soon, get help because you're next. All right, that's, that's some scary stuff going on. She doesn't want like a go-kart, she doesn't want golden gooses, she doesn't want a PS5, she wants the head of a man. So verse nine, the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his gifts, he commanded it to be given. So he says, fine, I'm gonna give you what you want for your, what you want for your dance. Verse 10, he sent and had John beheaded in the prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. Man, when I read the Bible, sometimes I read the Bible and people think the Bible is like boring or it's just like irrelevant kind of stories. The Bible is at times like violent and ruthless in the stories. This is not stories that you read to your kids and say, okay, shh, now go to bed, right? So this head is coming on a platter. And then verse 12, and his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and they told Jesus. Now, John the Baptist didn't necessarily deserve this. John the Baptist spent his days 
preaching, preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist set himself apart. He was a holy man who dressed in a holy way and ate in a peculiar way in order to communicate the peculiarity and the uniqueness of the message that God had sent him to share. He was preparing the way, but listen to this. He was preparing the way for his best friend. In a season of grief, like we'll see that Jesus walked through, people sometimes begin to question everyone and everything, including God. And maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been there at the loss of a loved one, or maybe you've been there at the news from a doctor, or maybe you've been there in, in deep financial insecurity or job insecurity, or maybe you've been there in the deep seat of the hold of addiction, and you've thought, man, God, where are you in this? Or God, when are you going to deliver me? Or God, how am I going to get out of this? Well, here's the thing that we've gotta understand. The Lord owes us nothing, and the blessings of God don't equal the benefits of this world. The blessings of God don't equal the benefits of this world. And maybe in the past at another church or in your spiritual past, people told you, hey, give your life to Jesus and everything's going to be okay. Or if you just love Jesus, then the joy and the peace of the Lord will pervade your heart every minute of every second of every day. Well, I've been walking with Jesus for a little while, and the joy and the peace of Jesus doesn't permeate my deep, dark, broken heart every minute of every hour of every day. Because the blessings of God don't equal the benefits of this world. And sometimes when we faithfully walk with Jesus, it doesn't give us the type of benefits that other people would point to. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something that's been incredibly helpful to me, and it's been super helpful to people in our church that we've helped disciple and walk with the Lord. Sometimes faithfulness doesn't have a good feeling. Sometimes faithfulness doesn't have a good feeling. Sometimes we think, man, when I'm faithful and I start really reading my Bible and I to really start praying and I start serving in this church, then I'm gonna get this euphoria of joy and happiness and peace that'll wash over me. Sometimes it just feels super ordinary. Sometimes it feels really painful. Sometimes it feels really, really lonely because the blessings of God don't equal the benefits of this world. The absence or presence of pain doesn't equal the absence or presence of God. Stephen, the first deacon, he knew this in Acts chapter 7. We see him in verse 59 and 60 after he's called to be a deacon, to carry this label of a servant. He stands up, preaches the gospel. Look what happens to him. And as they were stoning Stephen, God bless you, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So here you see a man who's faithfully walking with Jesus, who's preaching the gospel, who's putting the, his life on the line. He's stoned to death for preaching the gospel, but yet he is a faithful servant of God. He understood that the Lord owes him nothing. Now listen, Here's a question I'd, I'd have for you. And maybe even if you're, if, you're not yet, if you're not yet made the decision to walk with Jesus and you have your own questions or apprehensions about Jesus and spiritual things and church and all that kind of stuff, here's a question for you. What do you think the Lord owes you? What do you think he's, is he indebted? Do you feel the Lord is indebted to you? Because of maybe something that happened or something you experienced. What do you think that he owes you? Because here's the thing. Mature followers of Jesus understand the Lord owes us nothing other than wrath and judgment. But God in his grace gives us Jesus who saves us from our sins and gives us new life in him. And look, when you understand that, you won't wonder or worry or whine. You'll learn to wait on the Lord. We are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but to the spirit to live according to the spirit. That's point number one. Point number two is this. We need to learn to grieve like Jesus. Learn to grieve like Jesus. Verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, and we'll talk about this in a second, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. So Jesus, listen, Jesus had this moment and I love, man, the Bible goes there again and again and again in these dark places of our hearts and of our minds. The disciples go to Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been on the, on the giving end of this conversation or if you've been on the receiving end of this conversation. Both are excruciating. They go to Jesus to tell Jesus 
that his best friend since before they were born has been beheaded and he's now dead. And man, you know, and maybe even your brain goes to that place, man. The police officers told you, or your best friend called you, or your spouse reached out to you, and you heard that news, and it was just like a gut punch to your soul. Somebody confessed some sin to you. Somebody said some secret things that you never knew were happening. And it was like, like the air was like deflated from your soul. Uh, Jesus felt that kind of pain here. This is not the first time that Jesus felt this kind of pain. And in John chapter 11, Jesus is asked to go and to heal his friend Lazarus. But he delays his trip uh, to go and see an, another sick person. By the time Jesus arrives, Lazarus, his friend, is dead. And this is where we find the shortest verse in the Bible. It's John eleven thirty five. 35. So if you want to memorize some scripture today, John eleven thirty five. 35, all right, is for you. You can write it on your hand. You can know it. It's just two words. And it says this. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now, if Jesus knew that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, then why, why is he crying in this moment? And Jesus knows that he's going to return as the risen warrior king to make all things right. Why is he crying in this moment? Because death is not a natural part of this world. It wasn't supposed to be this way. God created the world through Jesus. And in the beginning, everything was supposed to be life and life and life. There's never supposed to be miscarriage or hospice care or funerals, but Jesus looks at all of this and like you and I, Jesus grieves because the godly response to the brokenness of this world is grief, is grief. And look, you, you, the next sentence I'm about to say, you, you've seen true in your life and in the life of people around you. Anger becomes a place to hide grief. Anger becomes a place to hide grief. Anger at other people, anger at church people perhaps, or anger at mom or dad, or anger at God himself. Anger becomes a place to hide grief. Listen, there's no growth without change, and there's no change without loss, and there's no loss without grief. So if you want to change at one time or another, you're going to experience grief. If you choose not to grieve, or if you move through a season where you should have grieved too quickly, you'll likely hide your grief somewhere, and that somewhere is going to be anger, anger. Man, the pain that we face because of other people's decisions, the pain that we face because of our own decisions, we often hide that in anger. Now, look at, look at what Jesus does here and how he grieves. What Jesus does in this season of grief is he takes some time. He takes some time. Look what it says in verse Verse 13, all right, it's there. He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. So he knew, knew he needed some time. Like it hurt Jesus. And if it's okay for Jesus to be, feel hurt and enter into a season of grieving, then it's okay for you and I to feel hurt and enter into a season of grieving as well. But in contrast, here's often what some Christians do. Some Christians try to repress or suppress their grief. Some Christians, try to, some Christians try to repress their grief by denying that it happened or belittling that it happened. Or others try to suppress their grief by just shoving it deep down in their soul. This is more my go-to, my natural coping mechanism apart from Jesus, just to stuff it down and just ignore it and just say, man, I'm just going to choose joy in this moment. But we don't need to repress grief. We don't need to suppress grief. What we need to do is we need to express grief. We need to express grief. Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 130, verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Uh, when we sing, I will wait for you, we're praying a prayer of lament and saying, Lord, I'm not going to worry, I'm not going to whine, and I'm not going to wonder. Lord, I'm going to wait on you. And this is why this is so important. If you don't let it out in, un in healthy ways, you'll act it out in unhealthy ways. If you don't let it out in healthy ways, then you'll act it out in unhealthy ways. You'll become addicted to something because you didn't process grief. You have your own unmet expectations, so that rises up in anger against a spouse. Someone abandoned you, and now so now you act out in rage, or you act out in isolation, or pleasure, on unhealthy relationships, because you didn't take the opportunity to express your grief in some kind of a healthy way. And so, listen, here, 
you may be in a season right now of like, man, I, I'm there right now in this season of grief. If you're not, you likely have someone around you that you need to walk with in a season of their grief. Let me give you three quick sub points, three quick ways that you can walk with other people in your grief. Because I get it. Like sometimes people will tell you, this happened to my sister, this happened to my brother, this has happened to me right now. And you might say, I'm, I'm so sorry, but then you don't, you don't remember to pray for them. You don't really know what to say in that particular moment. I'm walking with some, a family right now in our church that's experienced uh, addiction. And I asked them, like, what are all the things people tell you? And they'll say, man, they tell me all the people in their life that have addiction. They'll say, hey, this is no big deal for God in the midst of it. They're just walking in, in deep pain with, like, no answers and so much grief. Let me tell you how to walk with somebody in grief. Number one, never minimize someone's pain. Never minimize someone's pain. Don't just try to get them happy. Like my go-to sometimes is I'm gonna joke with them and I'm trying to think of something funny to say or think of a way to just say God's so big and this is so small. Look, don't try to minimize someone's pain because if you try to shrink their grief, you'll just add guilt. You'll just add guilt. You give them opportunities to grieve. Number two, never rush someone's pain. Never rush someone's pain. You don't get over things, you grieve through them. You don't get over things, you grieve through them. Time does not heal all wounds. That's not a Bible verse. Time does not heal all wounds. Processed time will heal to some degree some wounds that you face in your life. And we need people that will slowly walk with us in our grief. Jesus himself, Isaiah 53, three, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In Matthew 14, 13, again, I love this about Jesus. When the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot to the towns. When they knew that Jesus was trying to withdraw and isolate away, they went with him wherever they went. This is like mom needing a minute, like going to the bathroom, and the kids are underneath the crack of the bathroom. Hey, mom, hey, mom, hung I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And you're just like, I just need a minute. I just need a minute to get away because that's what it's like to be a leader. That's what it's like to shepherd is people follow you where they go and people follow Jesus where Jesus went. But Jesus didn't rush people's pain. Life doesn't slow down for your grieving. You have to choose to grieve. You have to make a choice. You have to say, I recognize that this really hurts right now. And you know the kind of freedom that you'll have if you just express that to God? To the people that God has put around you that are close to you, if you just go to them and say, I'm really hurting right now. And you might think, they're gonna think this is so out of character. They're gonna think somebody's pranking them. Like, I don't really talk like that normally. Listen, maybe you should. Maybe you should. Because then you invite other people in to the opportunity to bear your burdens and to walk slowly with you in your time of grieving. Life doesn't slow down. You have to choose to grie grieve. Or in other words, you have to prioritize grieving in your life. So maybe, maybe even something like if you're a to-do list person, if you're a planner, a calendar, agenda type person, and you've just experienced something really, maybe you need to put it on your agenda in your calendar Man, spend time with the Lord just expressing grief. The Bible has a whole category of Bible verses for this, and it's called lament. There's an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations, and it's about God's people crying out to him in their time of pain and in their time of brokenness. So if you want to walk with someone in grief, don't minimize their pain, don't rush them. Number three, don't teach, listen. Don't teach, listen. Don't teach, listen. Be more of a catcher than a pitcher. The brother of Jesus said this. He said, be quick to listen and be slow to speak. So in other words, like if you just checked out for the last three points, sub points and all that, and you're like, man, I wonder what's going on in the NFL. I, come back to it. Here, here's one summary point. So if you think about walking with people in their grief, here's grief counseling one-on-one. -on -one. Sit with them, say, I'm sorry. Sit with them, and say, I'm sorry, man, what if, what if on this community, your church unleashed a whole just army of grief counselors who, instead of trying to give people advice and try to try to rush people, instead of just trying to give people nifty Christian Bible verses that go, might go on a coffee cup but, are, but are way out of context, 
What if you were an army of people, when you hear hard, hard things, you just sit with people and say, I am so, so sorry. And in that moment, it's not about answers. It's not about what's next. It's just about bearing one another's burdens because that's exactly what Jesus did. The greater the pain that you see, then the fewer the words that you probably need to use. The problem is not that their head is empty of truth. The problem is that their heart is full of grief. So if, if the conversation progresses, you can ask questions like, if you're comfortable with me, if they've lost a loved one, tell me about what they meant to you. And then just sit and then just listen. Man, this is not the natural way of the world. We wanna be funny, we wanna have answers, we wanna have advice. But when you walk slowly with others, then we have the hands and feet of Jesus who, with people who desperately need to see it. Um, so if you're grieving right now, if you're in that season, you're coming out of that season, you're entering in that season, there's all kinds of unanswered questions. Uh, you need to put yourself in a position to be cared for. And this church wants to care for you. They wanna walk with you in your time of pain. They have people that dedicate their lives to such a task, but you have to put yourself in a position to be cared for. I remember this one particular person that was in our church in Kentucky. And when, I, when I'm able to talk at other churches, I'm able to talk about church members that were especially hard to deal with. Because I don't know if you know this or not, because some church members are maybe especially more hard to deal with. And there's not many, but there was one, and she was known as a person who was very hard to deal with. And she had high expectations. And so I remember one time I was called to go visit her in the hospital. And I, I was glad to do it. It's what God's called me to do. I wanna love people. And so I went and visited her in the hospital. I walked in and I was like, just kind of, I didn't know what she was gonna say. She always had something. She always had some kind of um, critique or some kind of comment about something. And I walked in and she said, ha, I knew it. I was like, oh man, here we go, here we go. And I said, well, what is it? And I'm not gonna tell you what her name is, but I said, what is it? And I said her name. She said, I knew it. I knew you wouldn't visit me in here until you knew I was in here. <laughs> and I said, you're, you know what? You're exactly right. I, there's no way I could visit you until I knew you were in here. But as soon as I heard, man, I rushed over here to spend time with you. And to listen to her. And I did, and I sat with her, and I prayed with her. She had a number of health concerns and was able to, to just sit in the presence of Jesus with her. But look, nobody can grieve with you if they don't know. And you might think that strength is a characteristic that the Lord wants you to carry, but you won't find that in the Bible. The thing that the Lord loves is weakness. The thing that the Lord loves is authenticity and transparency and vulnerability in front of some people who walk with Jesus and can walk with Jesus alongside you. When we learn to grieve like Jesus, then we'll learn to grieve with Jesus together. Point number three, God will leverage your loss. God will leverage your loss. Man, I, can I just, I remember the, the, I've, read this, I've read this passage, I can't tell you how many times, in Bible reading plans, you know, you start real strong in Matthew and you maybe fade. I mean, I've started in Matthew so many times. I remember the first time I read this, I had to like, like put my reading glasses down and just kind of sit back from the page for a second at the beauty of, of who Jesus is, okay? Look at verse 14. Again, just lost his best friend, just went to a desolate place. Everybody's following him and wants a piece of him. So Jesus comes back to the people, verse 14. When, we, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. So Jesus felt tremendous pain and he didn't grow bitter or angry or defeated. He didn't resolve to never trust again and block people out. He didn't resolve to rain absolute fireballs down on Herod in the moment. That's what I would have done. I would have, whatever button that was, pray to my heavenly father that he would be annihilated into ashes in the moment in Jesus' name, amen. Like that's what I would do. But that's not what Jesus did. He had compassion on the people. The grief is a fork in the road. And when we face grief, we can either go the way where we lose our faith. And look, you know people 
who faced really hard things in their life. And when they faced the really hard thing, they were like, man, I, I don't know about this God thing. And they started questioning everything. And they maybe even abandoned their family. They just went on their own way. But then you also know people, or maybe you are that kind of person who walked through something really, really hard. And instead of drawing you away from Jesus, it drew you to Jesus. Because grief is a fork in the road. Man, that, that's how it works. When we grieve like Jesus, he will leverage our loss for his own glory. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. It says, God comforts us in all our affliction that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Man, you have no idea. Maybe not deep in the season of grief. Maybe so, I'm not sure. Maybe in a season of life ahead. You have no idea about how God may leverage your loss. Man, you've experienced the pain of miscarriage. <clears throat> You'd be You'd be surprised about how God may bring that person who's experienced the same thing as you into your life. You've walked through the deep, dark hold of addiction and God's giving you victory or a level of victory in your life. Man, don't be surprised when God brings along some people into your life that you'll be able to minister to and walk alongside as well. You've walked through the season of loneliness or anxiety or depression, physical pain. Man, you'd be surprised about how God may leverage your loss for his glory. Your mess can become a message and your trial can become a testimony. When you put your suffering and your pain in God's hands and you wait on him to do what only he can do. Philippians 4, 6 says this. It says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And in order to have a peace that surpasses understanding, you have to give up your right to understand. And I think so often we try to figure out the reasons for God's unfolding plans in our life instead of welcoming God's unfolding plans in our life. And look, I, I say that. It sounds easy, right? Like it sounds easy. This is super hard. This is so much pain. Nobody knows. God, thank you for all the pain and struggle that I face in my life. This is so great. But what it looks like more so is, Jesus, I'm trying. Jesus, I'm trying to have faith. Jesus, I'm, tr I'm trying not to just trace your hand and see the evil in this. Lord, I I'm trying. Lord, give me more faith. Jesus, I cry out to you. I depend on you. It looks like us throwing ourselves in trust before our Heavenly Father. Man, there's 42 chapters of Job questioning God for the things that have come into Job's life. And here, here's the thing. Even if God answered every question that you ever had, you'd still be hurting. But in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. What we think is that, God, if you showed me what the light looks like in every single step that I have coming before me and everything that might come my way, then I'll have really, really great faith. I think instead the opposite is true. Like if we knew every single thing that was gonna happen to us over the next one month, six months, 12 months, two years, five years, I think we'd be absolutely terrified. Absolutely terrified. We have some dear friends in our church who God called to welcome foster children into their home. And man, if you're a foster family or if you're a foster kiddo in a foster family, man, I pray God's blessings upon you in that difficult but unbelievably rewarding journey that, are, that, that you're in right now. Our friends uh, ended up fostering uh, two teenagers and one little, little guy in their home. And man, they walked through it. They walk through it with biological parents and with learning challenges and with behavioral decisions and a little guy who struggled to speak over time and speech pathology and visits and biological mom visits and court dates and all this stuff. But by God's grace, God eventually put them together as an adoptive family. And I remember asking them, hey, if you knew everything that was gonna happen in every single one of your steps along the way, what would you have thought at the beginning? And they said, we would have been absolutely terrified. <laughs> We'd have been absolutely terrified. Man, if God shows us every single 
light on every single step that we'll take, we'll be terrified. But we don't have to be because we don't have to understand all of God's plan. We just have to welcome God's plan in our life, in our life. A couple things to close. One is I was on, a, on that, the picture I showed of my family. We're on an out west trip, a sabbatical trip with my, my family that my church was able to, to give to us. We spent some awesome time out west. And uh, about the second week of the sabbatical, I got a call from uh, a friend who had introduced me to another guy. We'll say his name is, is Roger. And I was able to walk, through, walk with Roger through some deep, deep addiction. And man, if that's your seat, we've mentioned that a couple times. Look, there's no judgment at all. We have our own struggles and there's people wanna pray with you and walk you in that. He was, he was deep in that. And so we, we confronted Roger together with his family and he went to a, a treatment facility and got clean and has, had been uh, drug and alcohol free for, for a number, number of months. Uh, since, since that interaction that we had. And he called me and he said, man, I don't know if you heard or not, uh, it's about Roger. And I said, no, man, I haven't heard. I've been out west just doing, doing a thing here. He said, man, Roger was flying home in a plane uh, with his wife and his two young children and his father-in-law, and the plane went down and their whole family died. And it's one of those moments where, you know, it's kind of like the disciples telling John the Baptist, they're telling Jesus about John the Baptist where it's like, I, man, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to have words, but I don't, really, I, don't really have, I don't really have words right now. I mean, 12-year-old and 10-year-old boys and think of the plane going down. I was, man, I, this, is, this is grief un, unspeakable, man. It's like, I, I don't, I'm happy to help in any way. And my friend said, well, Roger's dad's gonna call you and, and he'd like for you guys to, to be a part of the funeral service and he'd like you to speak at it. I don't know if I've ever felt more inadequate than in that moment as, as a pastor. So we got home, I met with Roger's dad. And Roger's dad just said, man, I, I don't like, walk through addiction, walk through this. I, he's like, I don't, I don't even know. And Roger's dad doesn't know Jesus. He's been successful in every way that the mind could possibly imagine, except he'll lose his soul apart from putting his faith and trust in Jesus. And I'll never forget what Roger's dad told me in that meeting I had with him. He repeated to me again after we did the graveside service where there's an adult-sized casket and adult-sized and a kid-sized and a kid-sized. And, and I'll never forget what he said. And, and he and I have had a number of conversations. You can pray for us. We have a meeting coming up next week. He said, I feel like my life is falling, but I feel like I have nothing to grab onto. And I said, brother, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. And I've shared the gospel with him. And I'll share the gospel with him again. And I'll plead with him that Jesus and his kingdom is far greater than anything that you could achieve in the kingdom of this world. And I'll plead for him to come to know Jesus. And maybe that's how you've grieved, is one who said, man, I feel like I've had nothing to hold on to. Let me tell you about Jesus, who's come one time, to bear the weight of our sin, to pay the penalty necessary for us to be made right with God. And he saves us from this broken world. He saves us from ourselves. And he's coming again someday to take his people home once and for all, forever and ever and ever. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you go to almost any cemetery in, in America, and this was set up by the founding fathers long, long ago, who many of them had a strong faith in Jesus. If you go to any cemetery, 99.5% of the graves in that cemetery will face east. And there's a reason for that. And you can go out with a compass and check it if you want. If you're wandering around a cemetery around here with a compass later, we'll all understand what you're doing. You're just confirming whether or not the preacher's a liar. But if you go out and see, 99.5% of those grave sites will face east. And it's set up by the founding fathers who had faith because they're set up to wait expectantly for Jesus who will rise out of the east once again and will come again, not as a lowly servant son of a carpenter, but who will come again as our risen warrior king to take his people home. So we grieve as those, amen. We grieve as those, not as those who have no hope. Though we grieve in this broken world where we grieve, we grieve as those expectant because our king is returning. And this world is not all that there is. And the final word has not been said because our king has yet to return. So in whatever your grieving looks like now, let me tell you about Jesus. 
Whatever your Saturday might look like today, man, let me tell you about Jesus. He doesn't make all things perfect right now, but he sticks closer to us than a brother. He walks alongside of us in our grief and he sends us to a world that desperately needs the hope that he brings. And our, our band's gonna come, they're gonna play. We're gonna have some people down here who even love to pray with you. Man, one of the things that I think people grieve, I'm, I'm 44 years old, okay? So to some of you, you're like, man, that is so old. And some of you are like, man, I got, I got socks older than you. You're just getting started. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you in that. One of the things I don't want you to grieve in your life is to grieve a decision unmade. And the decision unmade that I don't want you to grieve is grieving the decision not to make the decision to trust in Jesus. I don't want you to grieve the regret of what it's like to have a life not walked with Jesus. And you might say, man, I've been done things and I've made so many mistakes and who knows, I mean, I, I, it's just too late. It's never too late. It's never too late. Man, don't, don't grieve as those who don't have hope. Put your trust in Jesus. Make the decision today. Turn from your sin, put all your hope and trust in him. There'll be people up here who would love to pray with you about that decision. Look, if you're walking through that season of grief, maybe coming forward and praying at this altar or talking with someone about it, is a first step in not suppressing or repressing, but expressing that grief. And in that place, in that place where you've put yourself to receive healing, God can bring it. Let me pray for you. When I say amen, we're gonna sing together. You can come forward. Jesus, Lord, we give you all the glory. Lord, we're hopeless without you. Without you, things are just sad. Things feel like there's only a period. But Jesus, you put a comma. And Lord, you bring hope. And you say there's a next chapter. And Lord, you call us out of a life given only to ourselves, pursuing the, the joy of the things that this world can offer, which are temporary and fleeting. You call us out of that into new life in you. So Lord, I pray for that person today who... Uh, is perhaps thinking, I, I don't know if I can go up and talk. I, 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 don't, I don't really know, but you're moving in their heart. Lord, would your spirit persuade them to talk to someone? Lord, would your spirit persuade them to make the decision necessary so they don't have to grieve a life wasted, but they can celebrate a life well lived in you. I pray they'll come forward, they'll make that decision, maybe in their seats today, they'll tell someone afterwards, Lord, I pray I'll do what you call them to do. For those walking in a deep, dark season of sadness, oh, Lord, some things in life are just so hard. Spirit, I pray you be their helper. I pray you be their counselor. You know them. You love them. Lord, your presence is here with us right now. Jesus, help us to walk alongside others who grieve as well, to be agents of your grace and your hope in a world that desperately needs it. We love you, Father. We pray these things in the name of King Jesus. Amen.